Hello, this is Ben Payton, and you are listening to The Bill Podcast, brought to you in association with georgefairbrother.com, mcgoldrickwatchrepairs.com, and Misty Moon Events. For over 60 hours of exclusive The Bill-related content, including reunion highlights, cast and crew commentaries, reaction videos, Bill Grimmage location videos, off-the-beat bonus podcasts, and much more, join the investigation from £2.49 a month at patreon.com forward slash the bill podcast Hello and Merry Christmas. Welcome to The Bill Podcast, episode 107, this year's Christmas Day special. Last week we kicked off a special trilogy with the first half hour of highlights from The Bill Reunion 7, courtesy of our friends and sponsors Misty Moon Events. The reunion took place at London Cinema Museum on Saturday, November the 12th to a packed and appreciative audience. These events really have become the hottest ticket in town for Bill fans. At the end of this episode, we'll be telling you how you can book tickets for the Bill Reunion 8, taking place on Saturday the 15th of April 2023, where PC595 himself, the legendary Graham Cole, will be the headline guest. Tickets have already started selling very quickly, so make sure you don't miss out. Selling even faster are tickets for Suzanne Maddock from Liverpool to London via the rest of the world. Her upcoming one-woman theatre show, where as well as discussing her life and career and how she landed the role in The Bill, she'll be singing to an intimate audience at the Phoenix Arts Club in Leicester Square. This show is also being produced by Misty Moon Events and is taking place at 3 o'clock on Saturday 29th of January 2023. If you missed the previous podcast, Suzanne talks about this show in detail. That first part of the Q&A also featured Lisa Gagan and Tom Butcher, plus a special bonus interview at the beginning with long-term Bill director Mr John Bruce. We pick up the Q&A with Suzanne, Lisa and Tom as I ask a fan question from Alex Mockler in Australia, who is a co-producer of the Bill podcast. I hope you're well, Alex. Then throughout this episode, you'll hear as the Q&A continued, we welcome to the stage producer-director Tony Virgo, original cast member Ashley Gunstock and our guest of honour, Mr Eric Richard. Oh, and we might have had a special surprise for the audience as well. Sit back, perhaps with a glass of mulled wine, and enjoy part two of highlights of Misty Moon's The Bill Reunion 7. I've got a question for the three of you from a fan in Australia called Alex Mockler. He said, I've always wanted to know how the police radios worked when you were out filming on the streets and you're calling in the CAD room. Who was the voice on the other end? Because presumably it was added on afterwards. But how did you play those scenes? How did it work if you had to take a... Well, it was usually Annalise, wasn't it? You know, it was usually like the girl on the script. So you do your bit, she'd read it back to you. Or sometimes, if there was a situation, you just got to leave the gap. And then you respond. Oh. But sometimes, you know, it'd be Annalise and she'd be thinking of a faz and other things and she'd say the line. you think, oh, God, <laughs> not like that. <laughs> no. Well, someone who knows a thing or two about the bill is our next guest. And he knows because he produced 81 episodes, directed a block for the Bill's 10th anniversary, and he even directed those famous end credit title sequence. Ladies and gents, the red unit is in the building. Make some noise for Tony Virgo. Now, Tony, you joined the Bill after a very successful career working your way up at the BBC. Ladies and gents, how about this for a CV? Before Tony joined the Bill, these are some of the iconic programmes he made. All Creatures Great and Small, Angels, Blake Seven, Doctor Who, EastEnders, 
Emmerdale, Secret Army, Shoestring, Survivors, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. That's the kind of calibre of programmes Tony had under his belt when he yeah, joined the bill. I was dead lucky, actually, to be honest <laughs> with you. I, I mean, I met, we were talking about Michael Chapman because I was scared of Michael Chapman, I might say. <laughs> I think everyone was. But he, it wasn't really the army, it was the Navy he did, oh, didn't it? Because he had that thing called the boat, Bosun. the, the Bosun house. house. Yeah. That was his office and his dog as well. Yeah. So <laughs> we're all scared. And I remember one time when I went into the, when I first started in the bill, actually, as you can hear tonight, this is a great, well-oiled machine. And you'd think, I'd come in and fuck it up, frankly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you would. And, um, and I remember th thinking one day, very early on in Merton, I was sort of sitting there looking at all these files on my knees, actually. Completely mesmerized. And Michael looked through the window and he tapped on the window and I thought, oh God, <laughs> it's going to be the second. <laughs> and he says, uh, do you want to come in my office? So I went in his office and we talked about politics. We talked about anything, to be honest, Ollie. And then eventually he, he poured a great big glass of Glen Morangi, which he had in his office. And at the end of it, he <laughs> said, um, Hey, a bit of advice, don't think about it too much. And he uh -huh. walked out, you know, it's, uh, Michael was, he was a kind of leading light, wasn't he? Just how different is the world of commercial TV from the BBC, where presumably the BBC was quite a sort of set menu of a way you could and couldn't do things, but I'm guessing the rule book when it came to the bill was completely different. You know, I just had a lunch a couple of weeks ago with David Liddermont. I don't know if anyone knows David Liddermont, but he was in ITV for a long time, and then he, from Granada, and he went to the BBC. And he said, you know, the BBC's fine, and it's exciting. You can do reasonably what you want, but it's terrifying because somehow everybody thinks you're going to take their job, you know. And, and there's the thing with ITV, it's very straightforward. Producer, you know, Thames Television, Lloyd Shirley was there sitting in uh, Teddington. You know, you just made the programme. But in the BBC, it's all about politics. So if you go into politics later in your life, that's, that's the career you want to do. <laughs> The bill was quite amazing in the fact that it was filming with two units at the same time in the same building. It was quite revolutionary. And you were overseeing a period of a program where not only all that was happening, but you moved sets from Barbie Road to Merton. It was very much put together. You know, uh, it wasn't glamorous, was it? it, it well, nothing was glamorous, actually, <laughs> to be honest. Um, the canteen, you know, the toilets. I mean, if you go into the toilets, you'd meet everybody in there. You know, it was just very, I mean, it was a very, very good gene. You had to be part of the team, Ollie. Mm. And I think you had to play um, a team's game, actually. And nobody was any more important than anybody else. You know, that was the, the secret of it all. Alcohol, well, there was plenty of that, um, <laughs> to be honest. And I had a fridge in my office, and Pat Sands had a fridge in her office. <laughs> Wonderful story, actually, because when I was fairly early on, we used to show the episodes on a Monday morning to Lloyd Shirley, uh -huh. who was um, the head of drama at Thames Television. He was like a, um, a Canadian hockey, a hockey player. He was, he was very, he wasn't very tall. He was enormously big. And you just, and he'd come up to like an inch away from you. You know, <laughs> it's very, it's very kind of like, oof. anyway, we had episodes to show him on a, a Monday morning at eight o'clock. And I had one episode, which I was a bit iffy about, to be honest with you. The beginning didn't quite work. So I tried a sneaky one of going into Michael and show him and say, well, don't worry, Michael, it gets better. You know, it gets better, you know. And Michael said after five minutes, right, stop the episode. Stop the episode. Yeah. Remake it. And I said, remake it. Remake it. We can't remake it. He said, I'm sorry. People will switch off. Remake it. So I walked out of the office nearly crying, as you can imagine. Pat Sands, who um, was one of the other producer, and she came out of the office and she said, what's wrong? So I explained to her what's wrong. And she said, darling, bottle of champagne, I think. So we had a bottle of champagne and worked out how we're going to do it. Wow. But, you know, there was a wonderful congenial thing about it. And uh, everyone kind of, you know, if there was a problem, they'd come and help you.
back in time, let's go old school now, because we're going to welcome an original cast member to the stage. And the stage is where this very fine actor has spent an awful lot of time this year. He's been in two theatre productions, and he's also made three short films this year. And it took more than a shotgun blast of a chest to prevent this legend from walking the beat. Ladies and gents, make some noise for the marvellous Ashley Gunstock. <laughs> Do you want to share that mic with Tony? There we go. Right. Welcome, Ashley. It's great Thank to have you. you here. Thank you. So, yeah, it's been a busy old year for you because you've been on stage in, uh, first of all, it was Witness of a Prosecution. What was that, what was that production like to work on? Well, that, that, that was a bit of a shot in the dark because I, my agent just phoned up and said, do you fancy being in Witness for the Prosecution? And it was a big production. Um, so I thought, yeah, why not? And it was only a small role. But being back uh, on stage, and especially what is classified as a West End theatre, was just superb. And it was strange because the camaraderie in that group was very much like the group on the bill, which was like my drama school as well. You had this uh, repertory company feel about all the actors working together for one common aim. And there were no stars, but... The bill, because of the kind of program it was and the quality of it, made stars. Mm. Going on to do work on the stage um, with fine actors in a, in, a, in a successful play and getting standing ovations at the end of it, it was just wonderful. Good for Absolutely. the soul, especially after coming out of COVID and the lockdown. Yeah. So, and you've been back, uh, you've made a... I've, I've been lucky, I've had a sneak peek of one of your short films, Uninvited Suspect, which is a... You play an evil man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a wife killer. Well, my, my wife actually wants me to do comedy um, <laughs> for various reasons. I always find these dark pieces to, to, to get into, but this was a psychological thriller, and it was about this guy who kills people who commit adultery. It was just amazing just to be there and doing these, this nasty character, completely different to the bill, of course. Yeah, a similar, so you're on the other side of the interview room yeah, this yeah. time around. Go, let's go back 1984 to Artichoke Hill. Describe a day in my life, making an episode in the genesis of this program we all love. You were there, you were in the very first scene. Yes, yeah, I've got, well, that, that, that in itself was a, a, a story. The, the director wanted uh, a laughter situation at the beginning. The briefing room was absolutely packed and uh, he just wanted, before Eric walked in, to, to give everybody their, their briefing, he wanted some sort of laughter to happen. So he said, does anybody know a joke? And I said, um, yeah, I got one. It, it didn't do the thing that he wanted to do because the cameraman was actually shaking with <laughs> laughter and the sh had, to, had to, re to do the shoot again. But you, you felt comfortable about doing that. I mean, I was the new kid on the block then and, and I just thought, you know what? These people have made me feel good about this. I, I'll go for it. And I did. And, and you had the opportunity to put yourself out there and really get into the roles. And if you, if, if you had a, a, a problem, another actor would say, look, why don't you try this? I'll put his arm around you and say, you know, you, you just missed a trick there. Why don't you do this in the next shot? And uh, I have to say, I've got to be thankful to Eric for that because on a couple of occasions he did that for me, you know, a young actor coming through and helped me out a couple of times when I, I, I needed to, to, to get the scene right. And you've worked with Eric on stage as well, as on telly, haven't you? You've worked on a couple of productions. And... Yeah, yeah. Er Eric's uh, a fabulous director. And uh, we... Uh, we did a play at the Leicester Square uh, Studio Theatre, uh, Children of Darkness, where I played another role which was dark again, <laughs> uh, much to the chagrin of my wife, but there we go. Er er Eric directed that and uh, r really, really gave us young actors, uh, or the young actors in it, I was getting old by then, but young actors <laughs> in it, the chance to, to blossom. He was generous, he, he helped the production to get on its feet, uh, and it was very, very successful. Well, I think all the legends on this stage will agree with me that tonight we are in the presence of a truly great man. And I've said it for years, but he's a wonderful actor. And for my money, one of the finest this country has ever produced. 
His electrifying performance in the bill, ladies and gents, has encouraged members of this audience not only to travel from all over the country to be here tonight, but in a couple of cases to cross continents to come here tonight and shake his hand. Ladies and gents, fellow legends, I think we should be upstanding and give a huge welcome to our guest of honour, Mr. Eric Richard. Raise the roof. Eric. Any of you who haven't done what we people do for a living, I'm talking of the actors, you cannot imagine what that was like. That, for what they have done just then, it's just breathtaking. Because you're used to getting up on stage and being applauded. If you're in a long series like The Bill, even now you're used to people coming up into the street, in the street and saying to you, what a wonderful man you are. But when your mates say it, when your mates that you trust and love say it, something else. Great. And I'm going to start with, it's a shame he didn't tell the story, because <laughs> the, the story about the joke, you've got to imagine this, to round it up a bit, is that we were a new company of actors. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Chris Hodson came up with this idea. These start all the same. Bob Cryer walks in and says, four seven over there, nine three over there, Charlie Makepeace over there. But let's, let's start with a laugh. Well, come on. I'm looking at my fellow actors. Would you, would you have been the one to put your hand up? No, I'm telling you, they wouldn't. But one of us did and it was Ashley on this occasion. But that unification and that trust and that care for each other was already there in the building. Now, this week on Twitter, the Billiton, which is the biggest fan site for the Bill, it's a fantastic site, they've been celebrating Sergeant Cryer. And I think we'd all agree with this assessment by Sarah, who runs the site. Eric Richard is an outstanding actor, and we were quite spoiled to have him in the show as long as we did. And that sentiment has been echoed by so many people on social media this week. And you and I had a little chat last week, because it's so lovely to be in this fantastic cinema museum. The cinema film is really what started your journey, isn't it, to, be, to becoming an actor in, in your early days? What does cinema and film mean to you, Eric? Well, I didn't go to drama school. I didn't, in fact, go to school very much. But what I do remember, and this is, and I don't mind, I'm 82 now, so that's how old I am, and therefore in 1942-43, my father was away in North Africa on business, and my mother, a migrant, comparatively new in the country, one of our days out in Brixton, which is where we, I grew up, would be to take me to the pictures. My very first memories in my life are being in the ABC in Brixton. It's now called the Fridge, I think, or something. It's a music venue. And why my memory is that good, I don't know, given what it did to my <clears throat> life, is there was a pushchair, and she could fold the pushchair up because I was disabled. And it was a time when the metals were not available. I could have a pushchair. So the little pushchair was folded up, and it was put into a little cupboard, and my mum and I would go in to a lovely darkened room. And to this day... The best moment of your life is to go into a proper cinema and that blackout before the curtains open and the world says, come in, come in. I've got a world here you haven't seen. Come and look at it. Magic, magic. So yes, it goes that far back. And then, I won't go through my life story because it's very boring, but I get to 15, I go to work in a factory, I don't like that, I want to do something else, I keep trying to find something else to do. Kept thinking, oh, come on, there's got to be something creative I can do, surely. And I was running a company by now, I'd made myself a proper middle class geezer. <laughs> and uh, I had a company car and a telephone, not a mobile phone, but a phone in the house, for Christ's sake. We're, t we're talking movement here. And I was running this company, and we had, it's relevant that he's a Greek Cypriot, George Kafkaris, who was our bookkeeper. And George worked in classic and modern Greek drama in Camden Town. And he and I would go out for a pint, and we'd talk about theatre. He would talk about theatre, i talk about cinema. And I went home one night to my then-wife, 
Christina, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to try a bit of this acting. In, in the same way that I might have said, you know what? I think I'll try snooker. <laughs> or badminton, maybe. Yeah, why don't, I do, why don't I do that? That was in November of 67. 68, I joined the company. Six weeks later, I was on stage in a little building like this in, in West Norwood. And the moment I stepped out, I was using this phrase earlier, Duke Ellington says you either have or you haven't got swing. I would say it the same of actors. You either got it or you ain't got it. You can't find it. You can't go looking for it. You've got an innate thing that works for you. Others, people can put it on top, but there's something about that innate thing. And I stepped onto that stage that night, and I knew that's where I should be. And 12 months later, I got my equity card going to Ipswich. It's not bad, is it? It's fantastic. No, I don't mean self-congratulatory, but isn't that as it should be? Yeah. Should, isn't it should be, you know, those of you that have got children, wouldn't you want their life, not all the other stuff, but that bit of opportunity of saying, I've got this idea, let me run with it, whether it's writing the novel, being an actor, singing a song. Anyway, enough of that. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. Ashley praised your work as a director as well, and... That was a wonderful thing about the bill, wasn't it? You already had this amazing job and the flexibility of the program allowed you to take a bit of time off from playing Sergeant Cryer and direct plays as well with some of your bill mates as well. So that's an amazing job, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> that's interesting about this particular cowboy is that theatre still remains my passion. If it's Desert Island Discs, and at the end of the show they say you can only keep one record. So if it was said to me, okay, Eric, it's time to go now, you can only have one more performance, where would it be? It would be in a little theatre like this, on a small stage like this, with a small group of actors. That's where my passion is, of the theatre, and that's to say nothing against the cinema and cameras, but that's where, that's where my heart lives. So when I was offered... The first three series, as you know how they were, and then they came and we're going to do now the 30-minute shows and it's going to be a long contract. I said to my agent, I have to be allowed at least once a year to go and do a stage play. I don't know if it ever came to you fellas, John and, and Tony, whether that was anything that was ever passed on to you that Eric Richard won't be around next week. Yeah, he's good. Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. And that's how important it was for me. Yeah, and Nigel Wilson helped... Oh. Uh, Nigel, Nigel were, the man. Yeah, I mean, it's just, just a huge machine, and yeah. the fact that you were all able... But, you know, they wanted to look after you. You know, yes. they wanted you in the programme, and theatre's still your passion, and you're involved. The Dickens Theatre Company. Would you mind telling us all about the Dickens Theatre Company? <coughs> well, it, the title gives it away a bit. <laughs> <laughs> a very dear friend of mine, Ryan, it's his company, he created the idea, and the premise is that he adapts Dickens' stories... And we take them to, again, small-scale theatre spaces such as this at Wimbledon. We've just recently been in Wimbledon. And also we take them into schools. So the, so the two things finance one another and keep it afloat. We've also added to that, we have the Dickens Theatre Company, because it is known that Charles Dickens had his own theatre company. He'd get his mates round and they'd enact plays. Well, we have Dickens Theatre Company doing Macbeth. And, wow. in, and earlier this year, we had the Dickens Theatre Company doing Jekyll and Hyde. So, yeah, it's quite an exciting project. Wow, that's fantastic. And I've got a question for you two original cast members here. Edward Kellett, who's, who's here this evening, he's sent in a question for me to ask on your behalf. When the bill started, uh, initially, the police perhaps were a little bit reluctant of it. They, they weren't so complimentary. That obviously shifted. Can you both remember at what point or why or what was the feedback you were getting at the time? When did it shift where suddenly the coppers were really happy with the program? Well, the, the thing is, is that we, we actually didn't know what we had until it went out. The company, Thames, were looking for something to rival EastEnders and they found it in the bill. And the reason they found it in the bill was because you were getting an insight into something that hadn't been shown before, which was the life of the Bobby on the beat. And, of course, the police would watch it. And initially, I think it took, took a while for them to come to terms with the fact that they, they were being portrayed on screen, whereas they hadn't been before. But you talk to police 
who who watched it then, and even some who watch it now, some p police that I've I've spoken with watch it now, the old programs, and they love it. Mm. They absolutely love it because, in essence, it gave the essence of what it was like to be a policeman, definitely. And we had people on there who were policemen advising us on the program, and I felt a little bit of a cheat, really, because usually as an actor you go out and do a bit of research. You didn't have to. The script said it all, and if you wanted any advice, there were police advisors there telling you the way that in which the police conduct themselves and the kinds of things that would be expected of the police while you were there on set. It was superb. I think Peter Kajin, actually, I think he produced the first yeah. series, didn't he? And I think Peter Kajin watched a series the BBC did, uh, Roger Grafe um, directed, which was about the police. It was off the wall, actually. And I think it took Britain by storm a bit. And I think he was very impressed with actuality, real policemen, real situations. There is a very significant moment, because I was with Peter when it happened, he would be an assistant commander, or I don't know the police structure at that height, but whatever, assistant commander of the Metropolitan Police. And he had taped the very first episode in his own little private VHS, and he'd written a page and more about all the things that were wrong with it. And he said it quite openly to Peter. He said, no, he said, I dissected this scene by scene by scene, and you won't get any support from the Metropolitan Police. That's as it was. But then, like, you've met officers. Well, I, I think I've told you this one. This, it will be the same with my fellow actors, is that this happened a couple of times. Most recently, I jumped on one of my bikes, motorbikes, got some old gear on, didn't look anything like Bob Cryer, crash helmet on, gone round to his shop. As I come out, chap came over to me and said, excuse me, is it Eric Richard? Yes, it is. Can I just shake your hand and say thank you very much? Because of you, I joined the Metropolitan Police, became a sergeant, and I've just done 32 years. Wow. I tell you, the responsibility of that is not that it is your responsibility, but you can't not respond to it, can you? I think, actually, the police at the moment are under a lot of pressure, and when we, when we did the bill, and certainly did it years before, I, I think it was a great advert for the, for the police, and I think they absolutely adored it. Mm. To be honest, you know, and a lot of the stories came from the police, actually. Mm. Well, know, there's so. someone else we can ask that question to who was there right at the very beginning. There's ladies and gents, Misty Moon Events and I have a bit of a surprise for you tonight. Because he's an extremely generous guest of honour, Eric Richard was happy tonight to share his stripes with another The Bill icon. So please, I'd like you to stand up again make the most noise you've ever made in your life, please welcome to the stage our surprise guest, the dame herself, Trudy Goodwin! Come on up. Come on up. Look at this, ladies and gents. Okay, I've been hiding in a cupboard for the last quarter of an hour. And it looks like it. Oh, thank you. Everyone's very happy to see you, and oh. as am I. Thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure, and uh, in fact, I only live very close to here, so it hasn't been a long journey. <laughs> we were just asking the guys about the, the police's response to the bill, the response in those early days at Artichoke Hill. Can can you remember the power of the programme from the reaction from the public and the police? I seem to think that, remember, they were a bit wary. And I certainly had that experience of when we were first filming Wooden Top. And uh, we were on the Whitechapel Road and Mark and I were in uniform. And uh, we were having a fag and a cup of tea and <laughs> in uniform. And uh, this squad car pulled up and a guy with a load of scrambled egg on his shoulders said, you are a disgrace to the police force. How <laughs> dare you be standing here having a cigarette and drinking a cup of tea. And of course the camera was miles away. They didn't realize. And we said, no, we're just pretending to be policemen. We're not really. <laughs> um, and of course they didn't believe us. But I, so obviously at the beginning, I think they were a bit wary. 
what we're going to do, we're going to open up to some audience questions soon. I'm just going to ask a few final questions. So get your questions ready. Then I'll be running around with this mic. So if you want to ask a question, put your hand up when I take to the floor and I'll, I'll come and see you. Over the last year, we've lost two the Bill legends, Ben Roberts and George Rossi, both sadly passed away. What are your memories of, of Ben and George, two fellow legends of the Bill? Most of them are unrepeatable, I think. <laughs> Especially Ben. <laughs> I mean, when you think of Ben, you just look. look at that. <laughs> That's what happens when you think of Ben. You're just laughing because he was hysterical, wasn't he? Mm. I was saying, I think I said this to you, Ollie, before, that there were times we'd be in the green room, someone would come in to call you because you've got a scene, and you're thinking, not now, not now, Ben's in the middle of a story. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He was hysterical, wasn't he? Him and Peter. One image I have of, uh, of Ben is uh, him trying to control his hysteria before a shot. Him mm. and Peter Ellis together were mm. uncontrollable. <laughs> there were parties that we had end of season, end of year, whatever, and there was a tape of outtakes. And on one of the tape of outtakes, there's repeated shots of Ben going... <laughs> 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 and that was his way of trying to focus his energy and stop <laughs> laughing. <laughs> And uh, he was just hilarious. That's how I remember Ben as a laugh. Him right. and Peter Ellis, they would just set each other off and they'd start what's called corpsing when you just can't stop laughing over something that nobody else finds funny, but you find hysterical. And they would, that would go on for 20 minutes and, and everybody would go, well, OK, we'll all go and have a cup of coffee and we'll come back and we'll try the scene again. <laughs> And it would never work. I mean, this could go on for ages. They would just make each other laugh, and I think that was largely Ben's fault. And a perfect example of the company, <coughs> we've talked a lot about the company of actors mm -hmm. that we were, is that an extraordinary creature like Ben would be in the midst <laughs> of it, but would just be part of us. It wasn't like, oh, there's Ben Roberts over there. No, it was all, we were all part of, weren't we? Mm -hmm. And an exemplary example, yeah. and George in different ways, the same again. Ben was was just the kind of person you have on the uh, on the team to make you laugh when when things are perhaps getting a bit strained as well. So him and George, who I met later, were fabulous people to be with. Mm. Really, I had a ball with Ben, and I know I had uh, the pleasure of in my first few episodes. I was with them, you know, in Brownlow's office, and I used to see them in the script and think, "Oh no," because <laughs> I'm a really bad giggler. The worst. Do you remember that one where it was the funeral and the whole cast were just collapsing oh. in heaps of fits of laughter? It was like the most embarrassing thing ever because you people were literally, as the camera was passing them, pretending to cry. And the person who died wasn't even part of the, the cast, really. <laughs> and, and it just didn't match. Why is this person crying so badly over this death? It was because they were laughing their heads off. And I was in the last row, and I could see the camera coming down, and I was thinking, oh, no. And everyone's collapsing in heaps of laughter as the camera's passing them. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And it got to me. I don't know how I kept it together. Awful. Awful. Can, I, can anybody re remember the name of that character in the series, something Fangles. Oh. It was a name that was in the script, and oh. it was a ridiculous name, and every single time Ben Roberts had to say it, <laughs> every <laughs> <one>. <laughs>that moment when Trudy joined us on stage will live with me forever. One fan in particular literally cheered like I imagine he would if England had won the World Cup in extra time. It was a magical moment. Huge thanks to Trudy for being up for surprising the audience and to Eric for his generosity in sharing his stripes with a fellow icon. Similarly, the way Eric embraced his fellow legends and very kindly me as he joined us on stage are also memories I shall treasure forever. My huge thanks, of course, to Stuart and Jen Morris of Misty Moon Events, Phil Clark and Graham Gertner of the Cinema Museum, plus both Martin Rudman and Andrew Ruff for your support on the evening. And of course, our huge gratitude to the legends of the bill and a very appreciative audience. Tickets for The Bill Reunion 8 can be purchased from cinemamuseum.org.uk. The headline guest will be PC Tony Stamp himself, the mighty Graham Cole OBE. And the reunion will be taking place on Saturday the 15th of April 2023 at the Cinema Museum in London. The closest tube station is Kennington. 
tickets for Suzanne Maddock from Liverpool to London via the rest of the world can be purchased from phoenixartsclub.com. This very special show will be taking place at 3 o'clock on Saturday 29th of January 2023. The Phoenix Arts Club is between Tottenham Court Road and Leicester Square Tube Stations. Over half of the tickets have already gone, so don't miss out on this very special show. There'll be more to come in the third and final part of highlights of the Bill Reunion 7, where as well as some more questions from me, the legends answered some great questions from the audience. And it's that that really makes these evenings very special indeed. That's how we're going to see in 2023 with episode 108 of the Bill podcast launching on New Year's Day. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Christmas and thank you, every single one of you who continues to support the Bill podcast. An extra special thanks from me personally to all the legends who've shared their memories over the last five years, to our sponsors, Stuart and Jem Morris, George Fairbrother and Simon McGoldrick, and to all the patrons of the Bill podcast. The names of the co-producers and executive producers of the podcast will now be read out by Sierra Oscar 007 himself, Mr. Ben Payton. Hello, this is Ben Payton, and you have been listening to The Bill Podcast, produced and presented by Oliver Crocker. Co-produced by Ben Adams, Sarah Kuyper, Alex Mockler, Laura Pinifay, and Simon Wolfe. Executive produced by Ben Ashmore, Joseph Beaver, Daniel Christopher, Alana Dewar, Andrew Dyack, Paul Dunn, Dan Evans, George Fairbrother, Luke Hegarty, Edward Kellett, James Ledane, Simon McGoldrick, Lucy McNeil, Gary Moncur, Stuart and Jen Morris, Claire Norbury, Tom Sherrington, Angel Stannard, Patrick Stratford, Michael Weil and Sarah Went. Brought to you in association with georgefairbrother.com, mcgoldrickwatchrepairs.com and Misty Moon Events. For over 60 hours of exclusive The Bill-related content, including reunion highlights, reaction videos, cast and crew commentaries, Bill Grimmage location videos, off-the-beat bonus podcasts and much more, join the investigation from £2.49 a month at patreon.com forward slash The Bill Podcast.